Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everybody. Welcome back again to As I Live and Grieve. Here we are again with another great guest. Our paths crossed uh, a while ago in a Facebook group about grief. Seems that's primarily the places I haunt lately, if you will. Dave Roberts is with me today. Hi, Dave. How you doing? I am great, Kathy. How are you today? Oh, I'm really well today. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today. Before we get started with questions and everything, which if you know me, you know I have a lot of questions. Would you just tell our listeners a little bit about your background, please? I sure can. Um, Well, first and foremost, I'm a retired addictions counselor. I worked for 27 years for the state of New York as an addictions counselor and a clinical supervisor. I got thrust into the world of bereavement primarily in 2003 after the transition of my daughter, 18-year-old daughter, Janine, on March 1st, 2003, the velia rhabdomyosarcoma a very rare and um, yes. aggressive connect, connective muscle tissue cancer. And she transitioned. And I use the word transition. Other individuals can use, you know, pass away, died. I look at transition today as the transition from the physical experience to the spiritual realm. And that's how I, how, how I envision that. Right. She transitioned 10 months after giving birth to, to my first grandchild, granddaughter Brianna, who is now 21 years old. So we've kind of, I've been walking the path of a parent who's experienced the death of a child for over 20 years, uh, but I'm no stranger to grief. I've been dancing with grief since I've been five years old, but my daughter's transition thrust me into a world that was unfamiliar and a world that I had to, to really gradually try to make sense of without the presence of my daughter. And that allowed me to do, do research and also to you know, re-engage in life, eventually re-engage in life with meaning and purpose again. Um, and um, I'm an author, um, a blogger, a uh, bereavement support specialist. I've done workshops on grief and, and loss nationally and, and uh, locally. I'm also, beyond that, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a husband, I'm a great-grandfather. I, I'm, I'm also a brother now. I was an only child for 66 years. Um, found a, a couple of years ago through the wonders of Ancestry.com that I have a younger sister in wow. New Mexico. So that's another part of my story that's, that has been written and continues to be written. So that's kind of me in a very brief nutshell, Kathy. Well, you've, your life has touched so many facets, uh, so many experiences. You already stole my first question. I was going to ask you why you use the word transition. Mm-hmm. And I loved your explanation and I may do- adopt that word in the future because I still, well, with my history, I still kind of get a little awkward, I think, if I use the word die and death. Mm-hmm. And I shouldn't. There's no reason for it. It's just, I think, where I came from and the upbringing I had as a child. Death and dying was nothing you talked about. You just, and if you had children and there was a funeral, you certainly didn't expose the children to the funeral. Now, however, everything's different. It's all about being honest, being open, Mm -hmm. and allowing children, I think, to understand and experience that there is loss, and it's going to hurt, and we just have to keep moving forward. And and another another thing, too, that I'd forgotten to mention, but this is a nice segue into the child piece, Mm -hmm. is that I'm an adjunct professor of psychology child life at Utica University. One of the classes I teach is death, dying, and bereavement. And we talk about how grief, you know, is experienced through the developmental life cycle. And we talk about specifically how do we deal in an age-appropriate way with exposing and and being honest with children about death. Um, And you're right, I think in the past... And I could speak from personal experience. In the past, we, as parents, we wanted to shield our children from anything, anything right. we feel was bad and protective. But what that does is that if, if we don't appropriately model for our children how to grieve, and we don't have open discussions and in a very, again, age-appropriate way, 
with our children to get them to under, understand death and understand that death is a part of life, we're doing them a disservice later on because once they experience loss, and they will experience loss, sure. um, it's like if we have an appropriately modeled grief, they may they may take a look at, well, this is how my parents did it, this is how my local guardians did it, so this is how, and it, how we did it may not, not have necessarily been healthy at that point, especially in terms of trying to keep them from the realities of life. Yep, and I think now I've just discovered a reason to bring you back for a second podcast because there's a topic we've touched on before, but I didn't realize your experience qualified you to address that as well. It's one of my favorite topics about how you can expose children to it Mm -hmm. in a very comfortable way. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple other guests mention something so simple as a walk in the park and you see a dead earthworm or or a dead bug on the sidewalk. That's the perfect opening to talk about death um, and bring it in very gently. So Mm -hmm. we'll just put that on the table for the next podcast. So Uh, consider yourself invited back for a second time. You you got to consider the invitation accepted, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, one of the things I wanted to talk about today, I heard you recently speak, and there were two phrases that you used that really intrigued me. I felt, for me personally, gave me connection that I hadn't really acknowledged. The one was continuing bonds, or continued bonds, Mm -hmm. and the other phrase was linking objects. Okay. So, can we start with continued bonds, and could you maybe... Start us in that discussion. I sure can. Um, I discovered continued bonds through the work of a gentleman by the name of Dennis Class. And Dennis Class is a professor emeritus at Webster University in Missouri. And he wrote a book called The Spiritual Lives of Bereaved Parents. And he also wrote another book. He edited another book on, on continued, specifically on writings related to continued bonds. But he was not himself a parent who'd experienced the death of a child. I'm sure he had experienced a share of loss. He was also a consultant for the Compassion of Friends and the Bereaved Parents of the USA, two organizations dedicated to helping families, you know, who have experienced the, the death of, of a child or transition of a child. And one of the things that he noticed and one of the things that he documented was the need for parents to maintain connection to their children in communities that support it. And you know, Kathy, with the with prior grief theory, with essentially stage-oriented theory, mm-hmm. it was like, you know, the, the mentality of many in society was that, well, we grieve for six months to a year. Right. If, we're, if we're grieving longer than that, it's considered to be pathological. Right. And after that time, we put our grief, compartmentalize it, put it in a nice little box, put it aside, and move on as if life has not changed or is like get over normal. it get so over it yeah go to get yeah. over it and what that implies is that we grieve through forgetting our loved ones after a period of time the thing i like about continued bonds is that it allows us to move through grief by continuing to remember connecting to our loved ones either through memory through the essences of who they are through their quality characteristics that that made them we made that made us of love us love them so much and so we can, can maintain continued bonds just by keeping them in memory, perhaps through prayer, perhaps through meditation, and just simply identifying those characteristics which we admired and integrating them as part of ourselves so that we can rewrite our life narrative. And that, to me, is what continued bonds is all about. And I tell my students at Utica University, when they see a lot of young energy come out with me, And they keep me young anyway by design. Sure. But when a lot of young energy comes out, I tell them, and in my death, dying, and bereavement class, I'm very transparent with my losses. And particularly, we talk about about Janine. I'll I'll mention that part of my life. And um, what's interesting is that when a lot of the young energy comes out, I could say, look, you're getting a package deal. You're getting both me and Janine. Janine has now become a partner with me because I've integrated the best pieces of her into the best pieces of me. And that just just makes it. It allows me to carry her, sure. Carry her with me. Um, it was not the relationship I ever envisioned happening, having you know, with her. But it's a relationship that I have now, and it's a relationship that I get peace from because I know she's always with me. Right now, is it specific to the loss of a child? No, you can you can do this with the loss of a spouse. 
um, okay. the loss of a sibling, the loss of a grandparent, the loss of a parent. Let me tell you a little story about continued bonds. If we got, we got time, but it's a quick one. Please. I had a friend of mine that used to be a bereavement support specialist for a hospice group. She used to do a bereavement support group for them locally. And she would have an activity. One night they, they, would, they would ask individuals in the group to bring in a photo of their loved one or an object that connected them to memories of their loved ones. And this elderly woman whose husband had passed, and they had been married for about 45, 50, 55 years, brought in a pasta machine. Now, the only rule that she had was that if you can get the item through the door, it's good. If you can't get it through okay. the door, we can't. Yeah. So she brought the, so she looked at, she asked the, the woman, it was a pasta machine, tell me more about that. Well, what they used to do is they over, they were over making pasta. They would talk about the events of the day, the good things that happened, bad things that happened. Mm -hmm. They would make financial decisions. They would talk about the children. They would make all their major decisions over that pasta machine and making pasta. So every time she saw the pasta machine, that linked her to the, the memory of her, her loved one. And a linking object, as I think as we talked about earlier, is any object, big or small, that links you to the memories of your loved ones and links you to the life of that loved one. And the thing about linking objects is that our, our stories of our loved ones, whether it's our children or spouses, come through through that object, and it's almost as if they're alive in real time. You know, I, I could share a linking object with, with my daughter that when I, I, I look at it, I can remember th those memories are, are happening in real time for me. It really mm -hmm. connects me to who she is, and it connects me to that time in our lives, and it brings me a, it brings me a measure of peace. It can be big or small. It doesn't matter. It's what, it's what the significance is to the survivors of, of those who have, have, have died or transitioned. What a great segue from one phrase to the other. So... Linking objects. Can you have more than one? Yeah, absolutely. You can have a linking object to your pet as well, too. And right. pet loss is another significant piece right. that a lot of times does not get acknowledged. You're absolutely correct. But yeah, I have, like with my, my cat Zoe, who transitioned last July, I have one of her, her bells that she used to ring on her scratching post. So every <laughs> time I look at that, along with her cremains, I think of, I think of the fun times with Zoe. When I look right. at... When I look at the linking objects or, or linking objects that, and I have a Tigger and I have a, 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 another, another object that are both linking objects that remind me of my daughter because uh, yeah. Tigger was her favorite Disney character. Right. So you could have more than one. Yeah, and every time you look at one of those, it jogs your memory, mm -hmm. which I think is healthy. Yeah, and it allows us to grieve to grieve through remembering as opposed to grieving by forgetting. Right, right. And we, we grieve through, through remembering and through connecting to who our loved ones were and are. Yep. And after I heard you mention linking objects uh, in the presentation I, I heard, I immediately thought of what must be the number one linking object between my husband and I, and that's a bottle of hot sauce. Tom loved hot sauce. He would buy... Hot sauce, if, he, if it was a new label to him, he would always buy it, no mm -hmm. matter where we were. We did some travel. We went to the Caribbean, and as you know, there's a lot of hot sauce in the Caribbean. Oh, yeah. And we mo sometimes would have to buy a special bag to pack all the bottles of hot sauce in that mm -hmm. he would purchase. Mm -hmm. There were so many bottles such that when he died, I went through, oh, I probably went through over 60 bottles of hot sauce that had never been opened. At one point, in one place we lived, I actually put them on a, we had a shelf unit on a door, mm -hmm. and I put all the bottles in there. made quite a colorful art display, actually. But then there's another object that has a deeper meaning to me, and that's an empty coffee cup from Tim Hortons, which is kind of specific to Canada and the northern part of the States, because Tom loved Tim Hortons coffee. Once he became hospitalized in the facility when I could no longer take care of him. Even though he had a brain tumor, he wanted his Tim Hortons coffee every day. Mm -hmm. So every day on the way, I had about a 45-minute drive to go visit him every day. I would swing through Tim Hortons drive through and I would bring him his cup of Tim Hortons coffee. Eventually, he got to the point uh, where he declined enough so he couldn't swallow anymore. And it it broke his heart, really, to not be able to have his Tim Hortons coffee. 
So at his funeral, a dear friend of his, uh, when they came to the part, would anyone else like to come up and say a word? A dear friend of his, Tim, came up to the podium and just set on the podium a cup of Tim Horton's coffee. And at that moment in the funeral, I actually smiled. I almost laughed in the midst of the funeral. And of course, I was brokenhearted. Tom was my best friend. So I think of that cup of Tim Horton's coffee, too. I don't go to Tim Horton's anymore. I don't care for the coffee personally. But every time I see Tim Horton's now, and they're all over the place, I can't Mm -hmm. help but think of Tom. So Tom is constantly on my mind, constantly in my memories. Except now when it's a bottle of hot sauce or a cup of Tim Horton's coffee, I smile. Mm -hmm. Those memories don't make me sad anymore. So that's how I know that I'm progressing. Yeah, and I think that's that's a good way to measure that, too, because in the beginning, in early grief, those kind of memories are bittersweet. Yeah, they hurt. Yeah. They hurt. They hurt. They're bittersweet. And, but as we progress and we move through grief and we continue to work through grief, those memories put a smile on our face. It's yeah. a reminder of their presence as opposed to a reminder of their absence. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one thought crossed my mind as you were talking um, uh, about some memories and how It's not specific just to loss of a child, which I personally feel is a loss that nobody should ever have to experience. Mm -hmm. It's certainly, I don't think, anyone's intention, God or any spiritual being, that a parent should outlive their child. Uh, it's, It's ghastly. Some people, when they lose a child, they will leave that child's bedroom intact. Okay. So that they can go in and sit down and be with their child, be in the same presence as that last moment that they remember them being there. Mm -hmm. Is that a type of linking object, continued bond, or is that something else? I think, one, I think it's, um, I think it's a linking object, but it's also a tribute to their memory, to their eternal presence. And one of the things that I think Another thing that I think individuals, regardless of whether they've lost a child, a spouse, or regardless of the loss, they're pressured to do something with the person's belongings Mm -hmm. within that six-month to one-year time frame that has been seen to be acceptable time for grieving by many in society. And what I I tell individuals is that you do it when you feel you're ready to do it. There's no time is relative. It's going to take as long as it takes to get individuals from the raw pain of loss Mm-hmm. to a point where they can accept that their world is different without the physical presence of their loved ones. but And in, in the course of that acceptance, they're willing to re-engage in life in a world that is different. Um, so it's whatever, however long it takes. And I, I know individuals, parents, spouses, individuals who lost a spouse who have kept their loved one's room intact, or they've, they've set up a, a cabinet where they'll look They'll put a lot of their things from their room right. so that it is, a, and it, they'll take it with them, especially if they move residences, as a reminder of, the, of their presence in that, in that house. And so I think it becomes a linking object, and also it becomes a way to honor the fact that our loved ones were and still are a part of our lives. So I think it serves a twofold purpose. Okay. So listeners, just to summarize what I heard Dave say, it's okay. You're on your own time schedule. If it gives you comfort to leave things intact, if it gives you comfort to leave your loved one's clothes in the closet, don't worry about it. Don't let anyone else judge you or shame you for doing that. You have Mm -hmm. to do it on your own time. For me personally, I wasn't able to get rid of most of Tom's personal items for four years. It's four years. They stayed there. Mm-hmm. I saw them every day, and they just stayed there. And yet, after the four years, it still hurt to clear them away. Mm-hmm. It really did. Which just proves that grief is circular. It's not linear. I mean, it could be, be four years. It could be 20 years. Uh, it could be three years. doesn't matter. It's just the, we can experience the raw pain of grief at any time, depending on what's going on at that particular moment. I think the difference is that as we get more... We always, as we move further along in our grief, we realize that the sad moments, the painful moments, are as going to be as every part of every part of our life now as the happy mm-hmm. moments are. Kind of those emotions kind of coexist together. And yeah. as I mentioned, you've heard me mention I don't hang around with talk, people who look at happiness as a 
the sole source of fulfillment. Right. Right. It's, it's individuals who are willing to embrace the entire spectrum of emotions that are genuine. Absolutely. That, I, that I are in my support group now. Absolutely. Happy is a lot happier if you've experienced sadness, I find. Mm -hmm. I think it is, too. I really do. And you can experience facets of happiness. You, know, you can be content. You can be joyful. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be like, you know, you know, super happy all the time and super positive all the time. You can experience those degrees, and I think our sadness allows us to do that. Right. For our listeners that maybe for the first time have heard the phrase continued bonds, linking objects, do you have a way that you could maybe encourage them to adopt that concept for themselves or adapt something to give them comfort now where maybe they're feeling just kind of bereft and isolated? I think, yeah, I, I think one of the things that I I. I I think a lot of times in, individuals in early grief do not give themselves credit for is their will to survive what's happened. And I think in that process, and they may not realize that, but they may gravitate to an object or a piece of clothing. You know, and I've, I've had individuals tell me that they'll hang on to a piece of clothing just so they can have the, the smell of their loved one. Right. And they're, what they're doing is they're embracing linking objects at that particular point without, okay. but of course the shock and the numbness that they're experiencing in early grief prevents them from looking at it that way. So it's just, they are going to adopt, I think, what is going to be comfortable for them in early grief. And then eventually as they, they move through grief and they, the shock and numbness begins to wear off, and they they'll start gravitating to other objects, which gets back to the point that you can have multiple linking objects. The linking object that you have in early grief, depending on what's going on, may be a lot different than what you have in your middle or later grief. And that's, yeah. that it can be. And that's also, to me, a sign that our grief has evolved. What doesn't serve us in early grief may now serve us in middle, middle stage and then later stage of grief, the later phase yeah. of grief. So that's just something that I think as our grief grief evolves, the, what we gravitate to the most as far as linking objects may also evolve with it. And I don't have any research to back that up. This is just based on my own experiences in terms of having multiple linking objects with my daughter. Right. Right. Um, I can link up to her through listening to the, a shared playlist of music that we both like. Right. You know, so that that can vary, and depending on where I'm at, and you might, you know, it's I may link to that object or linked to, to music more than I might link to another part, but it's just all part of the evolution. But I can, you know, it's, right. it's, it's all fluid. So it's possible, for example, since you mentioned music, that's one of the most common things, mm -hmm. I think, that in early grief, you might hear a song that it might, you know, you might know that your loved one yeah. enjoyed or appreciated that song, but you don't really connect to it. And then later in your grief, you might hear that same song again. And it will have a different reaction for you, and it will become something that you want to listen to again and again and again mm -hmm. because of the memory it brings. Is is that kind of what you're saying? Mm -hmm. And the other thing, too, depending, and I did a lot of reading in early grief, and I still do a lot of reading, and I think a lot of individuals who are grieving will read articles they'll read about grief. They'll read articles about individuals who have shared the same loss so they can get specific right. coping skills. And I think that's also a product of, of how we, you know, of, of how we either view linking objects or view our grief. For example, three years into my grief, I read a book by Brian Weiss called Many Lives, Many Masters. And it was a book where he was a clinical, he was a psychiatrist, he, he still is a psychiatrist, but he was a psychiatrist and he worked with a young lady who, under regression hypnosis therapy, found out that she had 86 past lives. 13, wow. 13 of those which were contributing to current presenting problems at that moment. Now, I read that book three years, and it, it didn't really mean much to me. I said, hey, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great story. It's intriguing. But four years down the road, four years down the road, seven years into my grief, there were circumstances that occurred um, that I'll, I'll get into later when I you know, talk about, you know, we do the wrap-up, that, right. that gave me a, a different perspective Perspective on life, death, and life after death. And when I went back to read Brian Weiss's book, it was like all the tumblers that started falling wow. place. So a lot of times we can read something in early grief as well that 
may not have any meaning to us, but depending on what happens in the, 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 as we move down the road, right. we can go back and read that same book and just get all new, new teachers. It's like watching a movie for the second time or third time. You pick yeah. up something every time you, you watch it. So we can revisit yeah. those things. That's interesting, and I almost never read a book twice. I almost never watch a movie twice. Um, I'm a one-and-done person, I guess, so, yep. uh, for whatever reason. Very interesting, yeah. very interesting. Yeah, th- this is fascinating to me, and, and the continued bonds. I-, I guess at this point in my grief and in my life, I'm really enjoying the little things that kind of pop up that bring back a memory yep. that I hadn't thought of in a long time. And if that had happened, well, Tom's been gone five years. If that had happened four years ago, four and a half years ago, I would have been in tears. Today, if that happens to me, I smile about it. Mm-hmm. And I have a memory and I, I kind of hang on to that memory mm-hmm. and bring it back to mind for you know days and days and days. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, yeah, it's we do grow in our grief. And if someone's listening and they feel stuck, please please take heart because it does get better. Mm-hmm. It does get better. Yeah. You have to grow with your grief. You can't be an idle standby person though. You have to kind of move. Yeah. You you have to have an open mind and be open to those things and let them come into your your mind and your heart and let them touch you Mm -hmm. and they will help you grow that way too. It's interesting how those inanimate objects can help us, can be Mm -hmm. maybe the trigger or the the catalyst, if you will, to growing in our grief. Mm -hmm. Well, sadly, that half hour just whizzed by, but it just means, as I say, you know, I have to have you back, Dave. You, You are so easy to talk to and one question leads to another, leads to another. It's great discussion. Thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. My this pleasure. is the part where, winding down, I turn the microphone over to you and let you speak directly to our listeners. So, here it is. Tell them whatever you'd like them to hear. Well, um, if you want to get in touch with me yeah, to, for further discussion or, or just, just to connect, you can find me through my um, email, which is bootsyandangel at gmail.com. My personal website is bootsyandangel.com. I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram. You can connect with me there. Um, I also have co-authored a book with the Reverend Patty Farino called When the Psychology Professor Met the Minister. And it was about the, uh, in part, about the spiritually transformative experience that she facilitated seven years after my daughter's transition in 2003, which convinced me that our spirit survives in consciousness after our death and we can connect with that and they can connect with us and also through our subsequent marathon conversations allowed me to understand how spirituality and science and psychology could coexist to help individuals transcend loss um that you can that book is available on amazon if you want a personal copy signed copy you can you can email me bootsandangel at gmail.com and we can we can uh, uh make arrangements and also, if you want to look at the website dedicated specifically to the book, it's psychologyprofessorandminister.com. And I will, I meet anybody, Kathy, at where their worst loss is. I don't want individuals to think because my worst loss was the loss of a child, and it was, and I'm not willing to meet them where their worst loss is. I don't trivialize anybody else's loss based on the degree of mine. Um, nice. So... It's, and I will meet anybody at where their worst loss is and be more than willing to be of support and companion as they, they're walking the, the, um, the road of grief. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and listeners out there and wherever you are in the world, and I know you're all over the place because I see the statistics all the time. So wherever you are, take heart, be encouraged. You can survive this. It is intended that we survive this. And you can grow with it. You can grow in spite of it. You can, you can become whoever you choose to be without losing the love you have for whoever you have lost. I've had four major losses in my life. And it is only just now, decades, literally decades later, that I'm finally grieving those losses because the way I was brought up as a child, 
Well, you go to the funeral, you stuff it, you get over it, you move on. And now I realize that nah, that's not how it should have happened. So I'm just going through those now. It's never too late. So take heart. Take care of yourself. Have some compassion for yourself, too. Be patient. Love yourself. Find someone who you can talk with very openly. Find someone like Dave, for example. Great conversations. You can ask him anything, and he will just discuss it with you. And as he says, he will meet you where you are. He will hold space for you. He's genuine. You'd really like Dave. Reach out to him. Catch us again next week. Again, self-compassion, please. We'll catch you next week as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.